Hey there, Leo here for Actualized.org. And in this episode, I'm going to be talking about Understanding Absolute Infinity, Part 2. Welcome to part two. Let's continue where we left off last time with part one. Make sure that you watch part one before you watch part two because we did so much work in part one that you're not going to be able to make sense of pretty much anything that I talk about here. All right, so in part one, we did a lot of very heavy metaphysical lifting and we basically explained what absolute infinity is. So you should have a pretty good idea about that now. In part two, what I want to do is I want to talk about many of the interesting and juicy historical connections and discoveries of absolute infinity. What is sort of a, an embarrassment to history and modern education is what you're going to discover in this episode is that there are all these remarkable, intelligent, wise people throughout history over the last two and a half thousand years who have discovered and cognized absolute infinity and have talked about it in numerous different ways, and yet they don't teach you this in school. They don't even largely teach you this in university. You probably don't know any of this stuff, which is why this is uh, such an exciting episode. I'm really excited to bring you some of these um, historical figures and the different angles at which they came at absolute infinity from. And um, let's just jump right into it. And let's start with the most important figure, I think, in history when it comes to absolute infinity, and that is a man by the name of Georg Cantor. He was a mathematician and logician, and his dates are 1845 to 1918, so fairly recent. Most of his work was done uh, in the early 20th century, and what he is famous for is that he is the father of set theory. Set theory is a domain of mathematics, which you don't really learn about until maybe you get into advanced mathematics and logics courses in college. And uh, on the surface, it sounds like a very simple sort of thing. A set is simply just a collection of items, any kind of items. So you could have three cats, five dogs, 10 cars, 20 trees, a billion people, 100 billion galaxies or stars, you know, whatever. So this is basically how we do arithmetic, is we group objects into sets, and then we perform operations on those sets. We multiply them, divide them, add them, subtract them, compare them to each other, find relationships between them. So Cantor formalized this study of set theory. And what's interesting about set theory is that it sort of straddles the fence between the domain of mathematics and the domain of logic. And set theory these days is actually very fundamental to understanding why math works the way that it works. The very like basic metaphysical aspects of math are uh, largely talked about in set theory. And you, if you really want to understand why does math work the way that it does, why is it so fundamental and perhaps so accurate in describing reality, well, you might want to study set theory. But set theory is a relatively recent invention. And it could not have come about other than through Georg Cantor. Now, uh, the amazing thing about Cantor is that he wasn't interested in just the regular numbers, like one, two, three, four, five, nor even just the rational numbers or the irrational numbers. He was interested in infinities. What is infinity? And what's interesting is if you go back through the history books and you take a look at how mankind and mainstream culture viewed infinity, even in the sciences and in the mathematics. Up until Georg Cantor, largely infinity was abhorred. It was seen as a scandal to the sciences and to the mathematics. Nobody took infinity seriously because the standard line of thinking was that nothing is actually infinite. Everything we know is finite. Therefore, talking about infinities 
is just some sort of flight of fancy or some kind of speculation or some kind of mental magic voodoo. And so no serious scientist uh, really thought about infinity. That is until Georg Cantor came along and he blew the whole field wide open. He turned mathematics on his head. And um, these days in the history of mathematics, he might be considered one of the most important mathematicians of all time. And yet in his day, he was denounced, criticized, and largely rejected for his discoveries. So before we talk about the scandal that happened there, let's talk about what he actually discovered. So Cantor was interested in infinite sets. Imagine a set of objects which contains an infinite number of objects. How do you deal with that? So he was just curious about numbers. And so he said to himself, okay, let's start with just the natural whole numbers, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, a million, a billion, a trillion, to infinity, right? So even in elementary school, we can see that the number line continues forever. And these are just the whole numbers. We're not talking about rational numbers, ratios, or decimals here, or even the negative numbers. We're excluding all those. So let's just take the natural numbers and um, let's use that as our baseline. So we can see that that's infinite. And then the question occurs to us, okay, what if we took just the even natural numbers? So two, four, six, eight, ten, and so on to infinity. Would that be a larger or a smaller or identical number of numbers as the natural infinite numbers? So see, Cantor was trying to compare sizes of infinity and um, he made some very counterintuitive discoveries there. So as I'm explaining this to you, I want you, if you haven't learned about this yet from somewhere else, I want you to just kind of um, play along in your mind and just to kind of guess the answers and see how good your intuition is going to be, because I'll give you the answers in a minute here. So what do you think? Do you think the even num numbers are smaller or larger or the same as the natural numbers? Interesting question. Um, but Cantor went further. He said, okay, um, what about the rational numbers? And by rational numbers, what do we mean? We mean ratios like one fourth, one fifth, one half, one third, three fourths, and so on to infinity. So what do you think about that? Do you think that there are more rational numbers than there are whole numbers? or than even numbers? Remember, each one of these goes to infinity, so they're all infinite. So are they then the same, or are they different sizes of infinity? What do you think? Take a best guess. What does your intuition tell you? And then Cantor considered, what about the real numbers? The real numbers are all the decimal point possibilities on the number line. So 0 0.00000000001 would be one real number. And 0 0.00000002 would be another real number. And you can see that there's uh, a ton of real numbers just between zero and one. Not to mention, if we go from zero to infinity, how many real numbers there are. So what do you think? Do you think that the amount of real numbers is larger than or identical to the whole numbers and the rational numbers and the even numbers. Okay, so make your predictions because here I'm going to tell you the answers. These answers came out to be very counterintuitive. And yet, Cantor was able to deductively prove this in very rigorous, logical, mathematical language. So here's what he discovered. He discovered that, in fact, the amount of even numbers is the same as the amount of whole natural numbers. The same. You heard me right. So your intuition might tell you, well, there should be half as many, right? Because in the natural numbers, what are the natural numbers made out of? Just the even ones and the odd ones. So if we just take the even ones, 
How can that be the same size as the natural numbers because you're leaving out all the odd ones? It makes no sense. And yet Cantor was able to prove that this is the case. Kind of weird, but it gets weirder because when we take the rational numbers, what Cantor was able to prove is that there are just as many rational numbers as there are even numbers and natural whole numbers. So rational numbers, this is even weirder of a result because you can see that there are supposedly an infinite number of rational numbers just between zero and one. How can that be the case? How can, how can this result be the way that it is? It makes no sense. And yet he proved that this is the case. And the last example is the real numbers. And this was the most shocking and scandalous example of all. Because here you might think, well, then the real numbers must be the same size infinity as all the others. And that means there's just one size of infinity. But what Cantor proved was that actually there are infinitely more real numbers just between zero and one than there are all the natural numbers and all the rational numbers. And what he discovered there is that there is different sizes of infinity. And this is what he proved. And this is what shook the world of mathematics. Nobody ever thought about infinity in this way before. And certainly nobody actually ever proved it in a rigorous fashion. So, then you can see where this is going. Not only did Cantor discover that there are two sizes of infinity, but he was able to prove that there are three sizes, four sizes, five sizes, and so on, you guessed it, to infinity. So there are infinite sizes of infinity. And he was able to demonstrate this and to show how you can create all these different sizes of infinity. Pretty amazing stuff. He spent over 20 years of his life every single day studying the logic of set theory and specifically of infinite sets. And these were the results that he got. And then, of course, all these results have been verified and have become established standard mathematics that you can learn these days in universities. It's pretty advanced type of mathematics, so they don't teach it to you in high school. So many people never learned about this stuff. But nevertheless, this is the case. Very, very counterintuitive. He had to come up with some ingenious reasoning and arguments for how to prove this stuff. One of the ways he did it is he came up with this famous diagonalization argument, which I can't go into here. It's quite technical, and I don't want to bog this, this lecture down with, with a bunch of complicated math. But basically what it involves is a putting one set in one-to-one -one correspondence with another set. So what he says is that if you can take one infinite set and then match each element to another set that's also infinite, then those two sets have to have the same number of infinity. But if you can show that you actually cannot match up every element in this infinite set with every element in this infinite set, then that shows you that there are actually different sizes of infinity and that there's infinitely many. But it gets even weirder because Cantor was a devout Orthodox Christian and he took his religion very seriously. And what he discovered to himself is that not only was he just studying mathematics and logic here, but he actually believed very firmly that he was penetrating the mind of God as he was understanding these infinities. And he called the infinity of all infinities the absolute infinite, capital A, capital I, absolute infinite. And he referred to that as God. He actually thought that he discovered the essence of God. Because to him, as a mathematician, you can see how it makes sense. Mathematicians usually see themselves as studying the very fundamental aspects of reality. And so he thought that all of reality is made up of number and of logic and then of, of infinity. And then the infinity of all infinities, well, that's God. One of the reasons he thought this is because, see, he discovered that infinity has a, a very paradoxical property. When you take one infinite set, like the natural whole numbers, and then you take a subset of it, like the even numbers or the odd numbers, that's a subset, right? So you would think that's actually only half of the whole. But what he was able to prove is that actually the subset 
of an infinite set can be identical in size to the whole. And this was a remarkable and scandalous result. Uh, but you can also see the interesting interconnections this has metaphysically with God. Because what this means is that if God is infinity, then every piece of God is also an infinity, which is, in a sense, equivalent to the whole. So it's like God is being holographically projected into every subset. And what that makes infinity capable of is that infinity is sort of pregnant with possibility in that infinity can spawn off smaller infinities which still contain the whole infinity within themselves, you see. So it's a, it's a very, very interesting result. In fact, Cantor wrote to one of his colleagues, Richard Dedekind, who was also a famous mathematician. He was uh, one of the only colleagues who supported Cantor. He, after he proved this result to himself, he immediately wanted to mail off the proof to Richard Dedekind to have him double check. But Cantor already knew his proof was airtight. And so to Dedekind, he wrote, I see it, but I can't believe it. He couldn't believe the result that he was looking at because he proved to himself this, this completely counterintuitive, paradigm-shattering um, feature of mathematics, which nobody up to those days was able to show. And this was in the early 20th century. Mathematics has a very long and rich history. So by that point, many mathematicians thought that they fully understood mathematics, which is um, an interesting lesson to those people who think that, oh, well, math and science understands everything. No, not even close. Just a hundred years ago, we made these massive discoveries within the fields of mathematics and within uh, quantum mechanics and, and physics and cosmology. So uh, we're still on the cutting edge here. But see, uh, Cantor had a problem in that he was uh, viciously demonized by all his colleagues in academia as a hoax, as a kook, as some crazy um, radical who was just uh, trying to destroy the field of mathematics. That's how most of the mathematical establishment reacted against Cantor's proofs. They didn't take him on his merit. And this really disturbed and bothered Cantor because he invested his entire lifetime into this. And not only that, but he wasn't just doing math in his mind. To him, he was uh, traversing the mind of God. And the thing that disturbed him the most was when he tried to show his proofs and his, um, his discoveries of God to his uh, Orthodox Christian contemporaries, they um, denounced him as a pantheist, and they refused to have anything to do with him. And this was basically the equivalent of being outcast as a pariah from uh, your Christian community, being rejected, and being called a heretic. That's in essence what happened to him. They didn't punish him, but they ostracized him. And to him, this was deeply disturbing, and it sent him into a deep depression and caused him a lot of mental anguish. And ultimately, he ended up spending his final days in an insane, in a, in, insane asylum. And that's where he died, because he was having mental breakdowns. Now, this is uh, interesting because there are a couple of ways we can think about this. One reason he was having these mental breakdowns is just because of the um, social ostracism that he received. But I think it even goes deeper. I think that one of the reasons he ended up in this insane asylum is because he was actually tapping into the mind of God, into absolute infinity. I'm not sure whether he actually had direct consciousness or enlightenment experiences. Maybe he did. If he did, I can understand why he might then lose his mental stability. Well, it's because when you are having enlightenment glimpses but your entire culture around you is telling you that all that is wrong and also again goes against your fundamental faith in Orthodox Christianity, which denounces pantheism, then, um, then you can see how this creates a giant kind of rift in your mind. And then you're not sure how to cope with this. Do I stay loyal to my faith and to orthodoxy 
or do I accept what my proofs and what my reasoning and what my direct insights are showing me, which is that everything is unified, everything is infinite, and therefore pantheism is true. You see, the problem with Orthodox Christianity is that they deny pantheism. Whereas, in fact, Jesus was, of course, a pantheist. He was enlightened. Enlightenment is pantheism. That's what it is. But, of course, to, uh, to an Orthodox mind, to a traditionalist mind, it makes no sense. And it's very threatening, that idea. Because they see God as some figure sitting up in the clouds who created the world in seven days and all this other kind of silly nonsense. They don't recognize those as just metaphors trying to point to absolute infinity, which is by its nature formless. And so how are you going to understand the formless, especially in a mainstream context? You can't talk about absolute infinity in a Bible. <laughs> well, one of the reasons is because when the Bible was written, they didn't even have these notions of infinity or the absolute. You know, these things um, are mostly the byproducts of uh, centuries of of human cultural development. So it took a while for that stuff to, to be accessible to people. Even these days, even today in the 21st century, as I'm talking about absolute infinity, most people have no idea what I'm talking about and it goes completely over their head. Think about 2,000 years ago how that would have gone over with people. It wouldn't have worked. 2,000 years ago, what you needed in order to spread this idea of God and absolute infinity is you needed Bible stories. That's what worked well back then, by and large. So I think that Cantor lost his mental stability um, because either he did have direct enlightenment experiences and he couldn't fully integrate and make sense of them. Really, what he should have done is like gone to a Zen monastery. But I bet you he didn't know what a Zen monastery is back then. Um, or there's another possibility, which is that Cantor was a brilliant logician and mathematician and he was really good at symbolizing and conceptualizing absolute infinity, but he never actually got far enough to have a direct experience of it. He didn't actually have an enlightenment experience. And in that case, I can see even more so how he would end up with a mental breakdown. Because what he did is he spent 20 years of his life trying to conceptualize God. And he basically got lost in his own mind. And let that be a lesson to those of you who try to conceptualize absolute infinity. I know some of you are out there, like me, I'm a very big conceptualizer. I love to conceptualize this kind of stuff. But you also have to see the limits and know when to stop and when to shut your mind off and when to go beyond your mind. See, your mind can conceptualize absolute infinity to, to some degree, but you have to recognize that it's not it. And if you're going to spend the rest of your life trying to get to absolute infinity, through conceptualization, through using your mind, through reasoning and through logic, um, be careful about that because you actually might go insane. Um, I think there's a, a really good reason why famous mathematicians, I know multiple of them, uh, certain physicists, uh, of course we know famous authors throughout history, why they become depress depressive, suicidal, um, or end up in insane asylums. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a interesting and, and rather common phenomenon. And I think the reason that is, is because they get lost in the uh, depths and bowels of their own mind. You just conceptualize so much and so much and so much, and you don't know any other alternatives. Nobody tells you about meditation. Nobody tells you about self-inquiry. That you just keep conceptualizing, and then you keep going down the rabbit hole, down the rabbit hole, and then you actually lose your mind. That's what will happen to you. Of course it will, because you're trying to grasp the absolute infinite with this little tiny brain that you have. It's not going to work. Trying to do it is almost the definition of insanity. Now, let me read you some quotes from Cantor, because he has some beautiful ways of describing his discoveries. He said, quote, the actual infinite arises in three contexts. First, when it is realized in the most complete form, in a fully independent, otherworldly being, God, where I call it the absolute infinite, and he spells absolute infinite with capital letters. Secondly, when it occurs in the contingent created world, the world around us. And thirdly, 
when the mind grasps it in the abstract as a mathematical magnitude, number, or type. End quote. So you see, he talks about three different levels of accessing infinity. The first one is actually enlightenment or direct access. Um, and just the fact that he was open to this possibility shows me that maybe he had some glimpses. Or maybe he just knew that it was possible, but he didn't actually realize it himself. Secondly, is you see infinity all around us. Everything you see around you is infinite. These are like the minor infinities within the absolute infinity. You see, absolute infinity contains an infinite number of smaller infinities within it, which are also reflecting the nature of the absolute within themselves, like uh, an ever-expanding infinite fractal in infinite dimensions, in infinite colors, and in infinite possible ways. And thirdly, he says that you can just grasp it with your mind in the abstract. So in a mathematical sense, you can grab it as a formula or proof. That's actually the weakest way. You see, the most important way is to access it directly as God, to encounter God for yourself. He also says this, quote, The fear of infinity is a form of myopia that destroys the possibility of seeing the actual infinite. Even though it, in its highest form, has created and sustains us, and in its secondary transfinite forms occurs all around us and even inhabits our minds. End quote. So you see, Cantor wasn't just talking about a potential theoretical mathematical possibility of infinity. He's talking about that everything you see around you is infinite. And it's an infinity within an infinity within an infinity within an infinity. That's the most mind-blowing part of this. And lastly, he says, quote, I am so in favor of the actual infinite that instead of admitting that nature abhors it, as is commonly said, I hold that nature makes frequent use of it everywhere in order to show more effectively the perfections of its author. Author spelled with a capital A. He's talking about God there. I believe that there is no part of matter which is not actually divisible, and consequently, the least particle ought to be considered as a full world of infinity of different creatures." End quote. So think about what he's saying here. He's saying that everything is infinitely divisible, and every division is itself an infinity. So you can zoom in into reality as much as you want, and you're going to find whole universes and worlds and infinite numbers of creatures and things happening within. That's pretty revolutionary to think that way. See, and you can see how he got ostracized for it. But he he stuck to his guns. He didn't really give into the mainstream. He wanted to suffer a mental breakdown instead of giving into the mainstream. And what's amazing is that he died in ill repute. And then... Um, it took a few more decades before mainstream mathematics and science really caught on to his discoveries. And nowadays, everything he discovered is just considered mainstream math. So you see, this just shows you how powerful paradigms are and how dangerous paradigm lock is. And that to make a radical discovery in mathematics or in science is not an easy thing at all. Sure, you could make the discovery, but then when you try to convince <clears throat> mainstream culture or your colleagues or academia or the scientific community of your discoveries, well, um, you might be shocked to, to discover that they will not accept it because they're stuck in their paradigm and they are not going to give it up easily. So with Cantor, I think that he almost grasped absolute infinity, but I think that he was really on the edge there he wasn't able to have a really deep, full-on enlightenment experience because if he did, then he wouldn't have had any kind of mental breakdowns. Uh, if he fully accepted and integrated it, he would have become a mystic and a sage. And um, he would have went on to teach and he would have um, been happy. He would have been ecstatic. He would have been living in the, in the presence of God all the time. But unfortunately, he just didn't make it that far. He was a little bit too far ahead of his time. 
So speaking actually of that, the perfect segue is moving on to our next historical figure, Giordano Bruno, whose dates are 1550 to 1600 AD. So he was also a figure very much ahead of his time. You might be familiar with the name Bruno, not from the movie, uh, not from the Borat guy, but from your uh, history class. He was a famous um, heretic who was burned at the stake by the Roman Inquisition for his views about reality and the universe. What's interesting, though, is that he wasn't just a scientist. He was a Dominican monk turned mystic. And he was devoutly Christian. Except, of course, when you actually realize what Christianity is pointing you to, all your Christian friends, especially back in the 1600s, will condemn you as a devil. Because, again, you're going to be talking about pantheism. You're going to be seeing God everywhere. And that just uh, does not rub the Orthodox Church in the right way. So he was a monk, and then he discovered the works of Copernicus and Galileo. This was the time of the Scientific Revolution and the Copernican Revolution. And he was just so moved by, by these discoveries being made by Copernicus, and the discovery there was simply that, uh, it's really more of an insight or a paradigm shift than a discovery, is the idea that the Earth is not at the center of the universe, but actually is orbiting around the sun. And of course, Copernicus and Galileo were also called heretics, and they were also rejected by the establishment. Um, their lives were also endangered. Um, but Bruno, because he was a mystic, he took it one step further, uh, one step beyond the pale for the church. He wrote a book called On the Infinite Universe and Worlds. And then he went around all Europe promoting his radical ideas, which he talks about in the book. Let me read you some quotes. This is uh, remarkable stuff. Quote, There is a single general space, a single vast immensity, which we may freely call void, void with a capital V. In it are innumerable globes like this on which we live and grow. This space we declare to be infinite, since neither reason Convenience, possibility, nor sense perception, nor nature assigned to it a limit. In it are many worlds of the same kind as our own. He also says, quote, Innumerable suns exist. Innumerable earths revolve around these suns in a manner similar to the way the seven planets revolve around our sun. And living beings inhabit these worlds. End quote. Now, keep in mind, this is the 1600s. The 1600s, he says this. <laughs> this is before we have even, like, telescopes. Before we have any satellites. Before we travel to the moon. We don't even have science fiction novels back then. And he's already talking about uh, uh, millions of, of stars with planets around them, with living beings living on them. Think about how ridiculously uh, visionary he was. And then he says, quote, The one infinite, and he spells those with capital letters, is perfect. Simply and of itself, nothing can be greater or better than it. This is the one whole everywhere, God, universal nature, not but the infinite can be a perfect image and reflection thereof, for the finite is imperfect. Every sensible world is imperfect, whereof evil and good, matter and form, light and darkness, sadness and joy, unite, and all things are everywhere in change and motion. But all things come in infinity to the order of unity, truth, and goodness. End quote. So clearly he realized that we are living in an absolute infinity and he saw the full ramifications of that. He saw the relativity of it. He was able to connect the dots and to apply the relativity and to um, 
to convince himself that, hey, planet Earth, human beings, we're just one tiny speck of this entire creation, and there's nothing really special about us. And for this, he was eventually um, arrested. He was tried over a period of 10 years and ultimately hung upside down, tortured and burned at the stake in 1600 by the Roman Inquisition for heresy and for pantheism and for advancing his idea of uh, multiple worlds and multiple universes. Pretty uh, remarkable stuff. See, this is what happens when you are ahead of your time in your thinking. This is what happens when you challenge paradigms. It's not taken lightly. And it's still not taken lightly today. You might think, well, that was close to the Middle Ages. That was 500 years ago or whatever. And there, you know, we've, we've outgrown those barbaric times. Really? Have we? Have we really? Look at what's going on in our culture. We can't even get facts straight about presidential candidates. And yet, um, you're saying that there's no problems with paradigm locks in our society? There are huge problems. It's as big a problem as it's ever been. It's just that we're, <laughs> we're a little bit more civil about it these days. We usually don't burn people at the stake. Although, you know, in some countries, they might stone to death for this sort of stuff. So uh, keep that in mind when you're learning radical stuff. When you're trying to go deep into reality to understand some facet of reality, um, you have to understand that you're leaving the comfortable herd mentality that you've been in for your entire life. Don't expect social support. Don't expect double blind experiments. Don't expect scientific backing. If you want that stuff, you're scared. You're sitting in the herd. That means you got to be part of the herd. And what we're talking about with deep self-actualization is, is we're talking about um, going off-roading into uncharted territories. And uh, there might be dragons there. There might be aliens. There might be all sorts of weird stuff. You just don't know what you'll find. That's why radical open-mindedness is such an important uh, principle to obey. And understanding epistemology and paradigm locks and false skepticism and default positions, all this stuff that I keep harping on, um, you can see why it's so important. Because otherwise, you're going to commit the same mistakes that mankind has been committing for thousands of years and still commits today. Many smart scientists, authors, and mathematicians still commit all these mistakes today. In fact, I, I, have, um, I had a written correspondence with a with a, a really good mathematician in a, in a university. And I was trying to communicate with him about absolute infinity. And he was just not open to it, even though he understands what absolute infinity is mathematically, but he's not open to the possibility of having a direct experience of absolute infinity for himself and realizing that that's what God is. He's not open to that because he's, he's stuck in his mathematical paradigm, which says that that's not possible. Now let's go a little bit further back in time to the ancient Greeks and Romans, because actually the ancient Greeks and Romans were a lot wiser than many of the Christians that followed afterwards, because largely they weren't as crippled by dogma and paradigm lock. So firstly, we've got Aristotle, whose dates are 384 to 322 BC. Here's what he said. If coming to be and passing away do not give out, it is only because that from which things come to be is infinite. And he says, quote, the limited always finds its limit in something. So that there must be no limit if everything is always limited by something different from itself. End quote. So Aristotle clearly understood uh, some of the ramifications of infinity and this idea that things always need another limit to limit them. And so because of this, we must have an ever uh, expanding chain of limits, which amounts to infinity. 
We also have an even later figure, Anaxagoras, whose dates are 510 to 428 BC. He understood this idea as well. He said, quote, There is no smallest among the small and no largest among the large, but always something still smaller and something still larger. End quote. Pretty remarkable. This was 500 years before Christ. This was even before the Buddha. And we have then an even earlier figure, Anaximander, whose dates are 610 to 546 BC. This is like the edge of written human history right here. And I want to read you some of Anaximander's ideas about the origins of creation. Uh, I'm going to quote you from Wikipedia because they summarize this quite nicely. He had two ideas or two labels that he gave to the source of creation. He called it the RK, and he also called it the Aparon. So first, let's cover the RK. RK is the same root as in uh, the word archaic, but it doesn't mean old. It means something else. So here's what it means. Wikipedia says, quote, RK is a Greek word meaning beginning, origin, or the source of action or the first principle or element. And this was uh, a term first used by Anaximander. The first principle or element corresponds to the ultimate underlying substance and the ultimate undemonstrable principle. RK designates the source, origin, or root of things that exist. Aristotle foregrounded the meaning of RK as the element or principle of a thing which, although undemonstrable and intangible in itself, provides the conditions of the possibility of that thing being. From this, all things first come to be, and into this they are resolved in a final state. This source of entity is always preserved. The Greek philosophers ascribed to the Arche divine attributes. It is the divine horizon of substance that encompasses and values all things. The RK is technically what underlies all of reality and appearance. End quote. That's from Wikipedia. So that's the idea of the RK. And then we have the Greek idea of the Apiron, spelled A-P-E-I-R-O-N. Apiron. It's kind of weird to pronounce. And Anaximander also used this term. Here's what Wikipedia says. Aperon is a Greek word meaning that which is unlimited, boundless, infinite, indefinite. Anaximander believed the beginning or ultimate reality is eternal and infinite, or boundless, subject to neither old age nor decay, which perpetually yields fresh material from which everything can uh, be perceived and derived. Aperon is generating the opposites, like hot, cold, wet, dry, etc., which acted on the creation of the world. Everything is gener generated from Aperon, and then it is destroyed by going back into Aperon, according to necessity. He believed that infinite worlds are generated from Aperon, and then they are destroyed there again. Greek philosophy entered a high level of abstraction. It adapted or it adopted Aperon as the origin of all things because it is completely indefinite. End quote. Rather remarkable, isn't it? How the descriptions of a guy who was writing and thinking over two and a half thousand years ago are uh, completely in accordance with what we, what we talked about in part one of this series. His descriptions are identical. What he's describing here is non-duality. A Greek from two and a half thousand years ago. That's amazing. And also, he talks about infinite worlds. A Greek from two and a half thousand years ago was able to foresee that there are infinite worlds in our reality. How amazing is that? But it doesn't end there. We also have Heraclitus. Heraclitus is also quite an old Greek figure. His dates are 535 to 475 BC. 
And this dude was fucking enlightened. He was clearly enlightened. He writes like a Zen master in short little cryptic esoteric phrases. Let me read you some of them. You have to really read between the lines with Heraclitus because he doesn't go out of his way to spell everything out for you. He says, quote, One does wisely in agreeing that all things are in fact one thing. End quote. Also, quote, One thing, the only wise thing, is both unwilling and willing to be called the name Zeus. End quote. You see how clever that is? You see what he's talking about? It's both willing and unwilling to be called Zeus. So this is the whole Zen problem of pointing. Anytime you call something God, it's not God. So should we call it God or not call it God? If you call it God, you do it a disservice and you're lying. If you don't call it God, you're also ignoring the fact that everything is God. Because God is both in everything, but not anything. He also says, quote, One would never discover the limits of soul should one traverse every road. So deep a measure does it possess. End quote. And now, of course, his use, the Greek word, use of the word soul, is actually spirit, more like spirit, or more like mind. And what we're talking about here is infinite mind, the mind of God, if you will. If you think of all of reality as occurring within the mind of God, all of this right here, look around you, this is all occurring within the mind of God. This is spirit. Spirit is not somewhere else. The mind of God is not somewhere else. It's all right here. You might wonder, but Leo, if, mine has, if God has a mind... Is that like located in God's brain then? Where's God's brain? Where's God's body? No, 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 no. You're not understanding the significance of what's being said here. When we say that all of reality is occurring within the mind of God, the mind of God is here. It's manifest. It doesn't occur in a brain somewhere. God doesn't have a body somewhere else. There is nowhere else. It's all right here. Imagine that God's brain and God's mind and God's body is identical. It's all the same stuff. And what is that stuff? It's nothing. And it's all right here. What we're really talking about here is we're talking about idealism versus realism. And people who are stuck in the realist paradigm, which is pretty much everybody on earth, they have a really hard time understanding idealism. Because the way they try to understand idealism is by taking idealism and then couching it within their realist paradigm. And then when they do that, it doesn't make any sense to them. So when I say the mind of God, a realist will think, oh, okay, the mind of God needs to be in a brain. Or it needs to be grounded in some kind of substance like atoms. No, that's not what's being said. Idealism means that you have the mind of God and nothing else. There's nothing there at all. It's not grounded in anything. It doesn't need a brain. It's amechanical. It's not physical. It's consciousness. It's pure consciousness. It's like a dream. Where is the dream occurring? Not in a head somewhere. Not in a brain. It's occurring nowhere. In nothingness. That's what idealism means. Now, if you don't like that idea, well, that's something you have to get over. If that doesn't make sense to you, you need to have a direct experience of it. That will fix your problem. But what you can't do is you can't then say, oh, okay, well, let's try to make sense of idealism using all our scientific paradigms. No, 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 no. What we're trying to do here is reject all the scientific paradigms. Not in the sense that science is wrong and science is bad. There's nothing wrong with science. Science is useful when it's used in its limited domain. Science is used to understand and manipulate the relative world. Science is not used to ascertain absolute infinity. It can't be because science is limited. That's what makes science science. That's what makes science different from religion. You see? 
the only way you can arrive at absolute infinity is through an infinite method. Science is not an infinite method. Science is a limited method. Every method, in fact, is a limited method. So how do you arrive at the absolute? Through no method at all. And now you can see why uh, Zen people speak in riddles and why a lot of times people get upset because when people talk like this, it's like, well, what are you talking about? It's all, it's just nonsense. It's not nonsense. It's just that you're trying to grasp it with your rational mind. And we keep telling you that you can't do that because what we're talking about is infinite and your rational mind is finite. You see, you have to be able to, to make a leap here. A leap of consciousness is required. You can't access absolute infinity with your current limited um, uh, state of consciousness. Won't work. Heraclitus also says, quote, in the case of the circle's circumference, beginning and end are common, end quote. And I hope you can read between the lines there and see that he's not talking about geometry. He's not talking about circles. He's using a metaphor there to talk about the the very fundamental structure of, um, of all of existence. The beginning and the end are the same. There is no beginning and end, really, just like in a circle. And he says also, quote, they do not understand how, while differing from, it is in agreement with itself. There is a back-turning connection like that of a bow or a lyre, end quote. And of course, he's not talking about bows and lyres here. What is he saying? He's trying to explain the paradoxical nature of absolute infinity. Namely that it both is and is not simultaneously. And that the duality of existence and non-existence has to come together and connect the way that they do in a bow or a liar, or if you have two sides of the same coin, the two sides, the heads and the tails, they have to be connected into a unity. They can't be separate from each other. See? which produces this whole paradoxical nature to it. Is heads different from tails? In a sense, it is. But is heads identical to tails? Also, in a sense, it is. Because heads is not separate from tails. They're connected together. And lastly, he says, God is day and night, winter and summer, war and peace, satiety and famine, and undergoes change in a way that fire when it is mixed with spices, gets called by the name that accords with the bouquet of each spice. End quote. And I love this metaphor here because this explains why it's so difficult to isolate God. It's sort of like you're taking some spices and you're putting them into a fire and then you're getting a different aroma. Well, when you get that aroma, you call it different names. Cumin, pepper, coriander, cinnamon, whatever it might be. But you don't see the unity of all those things. You don't really get the essence of the fire there because, or the smoke because it's just the, the smell. And the smell is what you focus on and you give it different names. Well, it's the same way with God. God, the indefinite, the formless, has no form. So it's very difficult for our human minds to grasp it. We don't see it easily because the things we focus on and see tend to be material gross things like colors, smells, sights, sounds. So this explains how God can be everywhere. It's right there. It's right here. It's right here. It's not somewhere else. God is right here. But you're not conscious of it because your mind is focused on ordinary colors, sounds, objects, people, problems in your life, emotions. You're so controlled and manipulated by all that, like, um, like a marionette, like a puppet on strings that you're not able to discern the very subtle quality of nothingness, which is permeating all of somethingness. You see? And then we also have Pythagoras uh, from the famous Pythagorean formula. So Pythagoras, his dates are seven, uh, 570 to 495 BC. He was also a, quite a... Um, in ancient Greek, and um, here's what they say about the Pythagoreans. He wasn't just a mathematician. The Pythagoreans called the first thing that came into existence the monad, 
which begat the dyad, which begat the numbers, which begat the point, lines, and finiteness. It meant divinity, the first being, or the totality of all beings. That's the monad. That's their word for absolute infinity. So Pythagoras was a brilliant mathematician, sort of like Cantor. But also, spirituality was not lost on him. And in fact, the Pythagorean school was this odd mixture of mathematics, but also occultism, esotericism, and spirituality, all mixed together. Because they thought that by discovering mathematics and learning various mathematical formulas and relationships and geometry, that they were actually um, coming into contact with the, the essence of how the whole universe is created and structured. And of course, that is God. That is spirituality. So they married the two. Uh, a rather interesting approach, which is very counter to the way that we do math and science these days in university settings, where we divorce all these, uh, all our scientific and mathematical discoveries from any sense of spirituality or significance. We don't see them from a holistic perspective. We just use math and science to, um, to write research papers, to advance our careers, to get Nobel prizes, to write books, to become celebrity scientists, to um, uh, make famous inventions, to market those inventions, to sell technology, to earn money, and to make a living. That's how we use math and science these days. Completely disconnected from the essence of being and all of reality and spirituality. We don't let our discoveries actually transform our humanity. We become slaves to our discoveries. And we do it in a very unconscious and mechanical sort of way, where our most brilliant scientists and mathematicians will reject everything I'm saying here. In these two episodes about absolute infinity, they might watch all this and uh, they'll just reject it. I'll just say, oh, it's just philosophy. It's just metaphysics. It's just theory. They won't be able to read between the lines and to see that they need to go and experience this absolute infinity for themselves. And the, the last Greek that I want to read to you from, Greek and Roman actually, is uh, Plotinus. Plotinus was uh, an interesting figure. He was after the time of Christ. So his dates are 204 to 270 AD. Um, and because he came later, we have a lot of his works still surviving. Most of those other guys, we don't have a lot of their works. We just have fragments. But with Plotinus, we have uh, entire books from him. And this dude was motherfucking enlightened. He was one enlightened motherfucker because he talks endlessly on and on about the one and how to discern the one and all the properties of the one, what the one is and what the one isn't in a very elegant sort of way. Let me read you a little bit from Plotinus. The one, and he spells it with capital T and capital O, the one is all things and not a single one of them. It is because there is nothing in it that all things come from it. In order that being may exist. The one is not being, but the generation of being. So that no other form is left outside it, the one must be without form. The one must be understood as infinite, not because its size and number cannot be measured or counted, but because its power cannot be comprehended. For when you think of him as intellect or God, he is more. And when you unify him in your thought, here also the degree of unity by which he transcends your thought is more than you imagined it to be. End quote. I love that description. So he's talking about the futility of trying to conceptualize God. Because as soon as you have an idea of God, God is greater than that. And if you increase your idea to that a little bit more, God is still greater than that and more and still greater than that. And so no matter how big of an idea you can imagine, it's still too small for God because that's the nature of infinity. It's ever growing. It's always bigger. You can't capture it in your mind. He also says, quote, how then does multiplicity come from one? Well, because it is everywhere, 
for there is nowhere it is not. Now, if it itself were only everywhere, it would itself be all things. But since it is also nowhere, all things come into being through him because he is everywhere, but are other than him because he is nowhere. End quote. You see, he's also talking like a Zen master in these sort of paradoxical riddles where he is both affirming and then negating everything he is saying. Because the nature of infinity is that it is and it isn't at the same time. It doesn't fit our human categories or simple dichotomies. It is the source of our categories and our dichotomies. That's why it can't fit into them. It actually makes perfect sense. But only if you accept the idea that you can't rationalize or conceptualize everything you encounter. You have to admit that there are limits to conceptualization. And a lot of people these days, even very smart ones, don't like to admit these limits. And lastly, Plotinus says, of the one, of absolute infinity, he says, it is a beauty which makes beauty. End quote. I love how he says that. That's a little uh, poetic quote for you to end that off. Now, I still have more that I want to share with you, so don't go anywhere, but we're going to take a quick intermission here because I'm reading a lot of quotes to you in this episode, and um, it's uh, quite straining on my voice, so I'm going to go take a short break and grab a drink of water. You don't go anywhere because I'll be back here in a second in your time, um, and then uh, we'll continue with some even more juicy historical examples. Okay, I'm back. Let's continue where we left off. So we've finished up with the Greeks and Romans, and now I want to move on to the Kybalion, which is an interesting book that was written pretty recently in 1908, but it claimed, it was written by an anonymous source, but it claims that these teachings in the book are hermetic teachings that go back to ancient Greece and all the way to ancient Egypt um, over 2,000 years ago. So the Kybalion has some beautiful descriptions of what they call the all, and all is spelled A-L-L, capitalized, all of it capitalized. And that, of course, refers to the one and only absolute infinity. So here's what the Kybalion says about it. Quote, The all must be infinite, for there is nothing else to define, confine, bound, limit, or restrict the all. It must be infinite in time and eternal. It must have always continuously existed, for there is nothing else to have ever created it. It must be infinite in space, because it must be everywhere, for there is no place outside the all. It cannot be otherwise than continuous in space, without break, cessation, separation, or interruption, for there is nothing to break, separate, or interrupt its continuity, and nothing with which to fill the gaps. It must be infinite in power, or absolute, for there is nothing to limit, restrict, restrain, confine, disturb, or condition it. It is subject to no other power, for there is no other power. End quote. And it also says, quote, Do not make the mistake of supposing that the little world you see around you, the earth, which is just a mere grain of dust in the universe, don't make the mistake that this is the universe itself. There are millions upon millions of such worlds, and even greater. And there are millions of millions of such universes in existence within the infinite mind of the all. End quote. And this was in 1908, so not that long ago, but still, science did not recognize that there were planets around other star systems. That wasn't proven until just recently. And yet, here we are anticipating this 100 years ago, and, um, and the hermetic teachings go uh, quite a long ways back, thousands of years. It also says, quote, the all in the earthworm is yet the earthworm, sorry, the all is in the earthworm, and yet the earthworm is far from being the all. And still, the wonder remains, that though the earthworm exists merely as a lowly thing, 
created and having its being solely within the mind of the all, yet the all is imminent in the earthworm and in the particles that go to make it up. End quote. You see, so this is describing how every object you see around you is a minor infinity within the larger absolute infinity. It also says, quote, nothing but the all can escape law. And that is because the all is law itself from which all laws emerge. End quote. That's the Kybalion. And then another source that I'll cite to you is the Law of One, which is a, a collection of books which are channeled works. And there's a lot of controversial stuff in these books. They're only about 40 years old, so not very old. But um, I particularly love their descriptions of absolute infinity or the creator. So I want to quote to you from that. It says, quote, Consider, if you will, that the universe is infinite. This has yet to be proven or disproven, but we can assure you that there is no end to yourselves, your understanding, what you could call or what you would call your journey of seeking or your perceptions of the creation. That which is infinite cannot be many, for manyness is a finite concept. To have infinity, you must identify or define the infinity as a unity. Otherwise, the term does not have any referent or meaning. In an infinite creator, there can only be unity. And it goes on to say, quote, How did intelligent infinity become individualized from itself? In intelligent infinity discerned a concept. This concept was finity. This was the first and primal paradox or distortion of the law of one. Thus, the one intelligent infinity invested itself in an exploration of manyness. And due to infinite possibilities of intelligent infinity, there is no ending, there is no ending to the manyness. Their exploration, thus, is free to continue infinitely into the eternal present. End quote. So you see, this is describing why we have all the dualistic stuff that we have. What's really going on is that if you imagine all of reality as an infinite singularity, the way that we've described it, imagine that what reality is up to is exploring itself, becoming conscious of all its possible forms and shapes out to infinity. There's no end to it. So this process doesn't end. So imagine this giant sphere, so to speak, and there's like this uh, ripple wave of consciousness moving through the sphere and exploring everything within the sphere forever. Sort of like a, uh, a video on a loop that just watches itself. Except since the video is of infinite length and of infinite content and can be in infinite possible ways in infinite dimensions, this video is just constantly playing itself out and it never really even has to loop because there's always more new stuff to explore to infinity. This one infinite video contains inside of it more videos and each of those contain infinite more videos and each of those contain infinite more videos to infinity forever. And that's what reality is up to is this self-exploration process. That's what you're doing in life. That's what I'm doing in my life. That's what every human being is ultimately doing is we're exploring. But we are not separate from this. Our perspectives are all contributing to the greater whole, to the all. In the sense that if you were a, a tiny video within the larger video, that would be one perspective. That would be like your life. And then the other video would be like my life. But then they're making up the much larger perspective, and there's an infinity of all these different videos. Um, so that was the law of one. Now, also what's interesting is to look into Kabbalah. Kabbalah is the esoteric and occult uh, domain of uh, Judaism. And in Kabbalah, they have this notion called the Alf. And the Alf is simply their representation of the letter A. So we have the alphabet, right? Well, a, alpha, alf. 
But also, the Aleph isn't just the letter A. In Hebrew, it also means the number one, or unity. And so, of course, the Hebrew alphabet and also their number system um, plays an important sort of spiritual significance in Kabbalah because Kabbalah is all about numerology and breaking words apart and finding all sorts of esoteric connections between the words. So I'm not too familiar with exactly how all that works. It's a deep art and science. You can go study it. But the important thing to know here is about the Alf because this will be important in the next thing that I quote you. So here's what they say about the Alf. The Alf is, quote, the primordial one which contains all numbers. Or they say, quote, it's a point in space that contains all other points. Anyone who gazes into it can see, any, can see everything in the universe from every angle simultaneously without distortion, overlap, or confusion. It's to see the infinite universe in a single glance. So going back to my analogy from part one of this series, I talked about the zip file. That's what they call this thing. They call it the ALF. That's my zip file. Same thing. So that's from Kabbalah. And the reason that I talk about the ALF and I talk about Kabbalah is because I want to end this episode with uh, uh, a long excerpt from a short story by Jorge Luis Borges. He wrote this short story called The Alf in 1945. And uh, Borges was an interesting writer because he wrote short stories, very short, just a few pages uh, long each. But all his stories were about the sort of paradoxical, puzzling aspects of reality. He was sort of the equivalent of M.C. Escher, but when it came to writing and not uh, art or painting. So this short, short story called The Alf is... Uh, the perfect capstone to everything we've talked about when it comes to absolute infinity. It gives you an idea of what it feels like to experience absolute infinity for yourself. Now, let me set up the short story for you. Basically, there's the narrator, and then the narrator has a friend. Now, the friend claims that he uh, has discovered the ALF as an actual object which exists in his basement. And so the narrator is very interested, and he... Um, He's sort of in competition with his friend, but he goes to his friend's basement to check out this supposed elf. And he doesn't know what it's going to be, or he doesn't really even believe that it's anything. But he just goes along to see what's there. And now I'm going to quote to you from the short story of what he actually experiences. Here's what he says. Quote, All language is a set of symbols whose use amongst its speakers assumes a shared past. How then can I translate into words the limitless alf, which my floundering mind can scarcely encompass? Even partial enumeration of infinity is irresolvable. In that unbounded moment, I saw millions of delightful and horrible acts, but none amazed me so much as the fact that all occupy the same point without superposition and without transparency. What my eyes saw was simultaneous. What I shall write is successive, because language is successive. Something of it, though, I will capture. Under the step towards the right, I saw a small iridescent sphere of almost unbearable brightness. At first, I thought it was spinning, but then I realized the movement was an illusion produced by the dizzying spectacles inside. The ALF was probably two or three centimeters in diameter. But universal space was contained inside it with no diminution in size. Each thing was infinite things, because I could clearly see it from every point in the cosmos. I saw the populous sea. I saw a dawn and dusk. I saw the multitudes of the Americas. I saw a silvery spider web at the center of a black pyramid. I saw broken labyrinths, saw endless eyes, saw all the mirrors on the planet and none of them reflecting me, saw clusters of grapes, snow, tobacco, veins of metal, 
water vapor, saw convex equatorial deserts and their every grain of sand, saw a woman whom I shall never forget, saw her violent hair, saw her haughty body, saw cancer in her breast, saw a circle of dry soil within a sidewalk where there once had been a tree, saw every letter of every single page at once, saw simultaneous night and day, saw a sunset that seemed to reflect the color of a rose in Bengal, saw my bedroom with no one in it, saw in a study a globe of the world placed between two mirrors that multiplied itself endlessly, saw horses with wind-whipped manes on a beach in the Caspian Sea at dawn, saw the delicate bones of a hand, saw the survivors of a battle sending postcards, saw a tarot card in a window shop, saw the oblique shadows of ferns on the floor of a greenhouse, saw tigers, pistons, bison, tides, armies, saw all the ants on earth, saw a Persian astrolabe, saw the circulation of my dark blood, saw the coils and springs of love and the alterations of death, saw the alf from everywhere at once, saw the earth in the alf, and the alf once more in the earth, and the earth in the alf, saw my face and my viscera, saw your face, and I felt dizzy, and I wept, because my eyes have seen that secret hypothetical object whose name has been usurped by men, but which no man has ever truly looked upon, the inconceivable universe. I had a sense of infinite veneration and infinite pity. And his friend replies, Serves you right, having your mind boggled, for sticking your nose in where you weren't wanted. And you may rack your brains, but you will never repay me for this revelation, not in a hundred years. End quote. That is the ALF. That is absolute infinity. That's what it feels like to glimpse God. It's such an overwhelming experience that stretches beyond all experience because it's really not an experience. It's prior to all experience. That when I first encountered absolute infinity, actually, not hypothetically, but actually, um, I still have scars on my fingertips. You can't see because the camera is zoomed in on my face and not on my fingertips. They're very fine scars. But what happened was that I, I experienced um, a very powerful energetic release. And this energetic release was beyond anything you can imagine the human body is capable of. Just like this, this surge of em emotions and also, um, I guess it was prana. The Hindus talk about pranic energy. It was like prana that just shot out through my body and out my fingertips. And my fingers, um, the skin on all my fingertips started to peel for about a couple of weeks after that experience. And then that healed back. Um, but then these sort of micro scars, these sort of fissions in my fingerprints, they have still remained. And my fingerprints have actually changed, and they're not the same as they used to be. So I know that sounds weird, but that, I mean, um, I wouldn't believe it myself if it hadn't actually happened to me. I'm still kind of in shock about it. Um, but it just goes to show you the power of this insight. This is not an insight where you just kind of sit back on your chair and you're just kind of mulling something over and it's like, oh yeah, absolute infinity. It's like, oh, yeah, I got it now. Oh, yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. It's not like that. It's so powerful that it actually it will, it will change your epigenetics. I think that that's what happened with my, with my fingertips is that actually like the, the genes in my body were changed. The expression of the genes were changed on some level after that revelation. That's how powerful of a revelation that was. So... Um, there's some evidence for you, <laughs> some anecdotal evidence for you uh, of what happens or what could happen when you experience absolute infinity. Not to say that that would happen to you per se, it's just what happened to me. And everyone's experience, of course, will be different. 
Now, in this episode, I covered a lot of sources. And it's quite amazing that there are so many references to absolute infinity throughout history. Um, in spiritual circles, in religious circles, in scientific circles, in mathematical circles, it crosses the boundaries of all disciplines. And notice here that I've only talked about Western sources. I did not even try to go in and enumerate all the Eastern sources, like yogic sources, Hindu sources, uh, Vedantic sources, the Upanishads. Uh, I mean, there's so much. There's Taoism. There's Buddhism. I just there's um, Shaiva Tantra. There's um, there's Jainism, and this is just still scratching the tip of the iceberg of all the Eastern sources. See? So there's uh, there's a lot of material there to dig through if you really care to. We're just scratching the surface. The biggest takeaways from, from all this is, firstly, I want you to recognize that reality is deeply paradoxical and that this is not a mistake. This is how it must be. That's the very essence of what reality and existence must be, is that they must be a paradox. Because the whole notion of trying to define something of making distinctions, this is all paradoxical because it's all relative. And the relative only exists because of the absolute. And yet the absolute is not separate from the relative, they are the same. And yet still, you can distinguish them in your mind, and you can access both the absolute separately, and then you can live in the relative world, and then you can come back into the absolute, and then also you can bring them together and merge them together. Non-duality is paradoxical in that it includes duality. And it's not separate from duality, and in fact, it's identical to duality. But the only way you can appreciate that is by first encountering the non-dual in its raw and pure form as absolute infinity, then you can bring that back into your ordinary relative world, and then you can see that, oh yeah, my relative world is not other than that non-dual absolute world. They're actually the same, they actually depend upon each other. Another takeaway here is that truth is beyond all human experience. Truth is not something you know. Truth is not something you believe. Truth is not a theory. Truth is not an idea. Truth, truth with a capital T, not relative truth, but absolute truth, is beyond language, beyond logic, beyond imagination, beyond brain, beyond physics, beyond even death. And it's beyond experience. It transcends everything. Because it must. Because when we're talking about truth with a capital T, we're talking about the most fundamental thing. And it turns out that it's nothing. And also everything. As it must be in this very paradoxical way. But perhaps the most important takeaway here is that absolute infinity can be grasped despite the fact that it's beyond all these things. It can actually be grasped by you. Not intellectually, not conceptually, not philosophically, but actually. Because it is actual. Because it's right here, it sustains everything because it's not separate from you, because there's no boundary between you and it. That's what creates the possibility of grasping it. But this grasping of it cannot be in the way that you take your hand and you reach out and you grasp a banana, like the way a monkey would grasp a banana, not like that. And not the way that your mind can grasp some scientific theory, not like that either. Because that's the same thing as a monkey trying to grasp a banana. The monkey's hand is separate from the banana that is trying to grasp. And that works in the relative world, but it doesn't work in the absolute world. In the absolute world, the only way to do it, to get there and to see what's there, is to become it. 
You must become it. How? Well, there actually can't be a method because every method is indirect. Every method is a sort of reaching out to grab the banana with your hand, which already implies a separation between you, your hand, and the banana. In the absolute world, we're talking about an absolute unity of everything. So there no longer is anything outside the absolute with which you could grasp the absolute. Now that might seem like that's a deal breaker and that it's impossible. It's not impossible. You just have to shift your perspective to such a degree that you realize that you are the absolute. You don't grasp the absolute. The absolute is what you are. It's what you is. But not something you've recognized yet about yourself. And of course, what that means is that you must remove all the limitations and all the constraints that create your sense of self and you. So what is keeping you separate from the absolute? Well, there's two ways to answer that. One is nothing. Nothing's keeping you separate from the absolute. The absolute is right here. You're just not seeing it. But two, what's keeping you separate is the fact that you're attached to all the things that you like about yourself to the way that you are, to your sense of self, to your ego. Now, the word ego sounds like it's a little part of you, but actually it encompasses a lot more than just some little egotistical part of you. Ego means every limited way in which you really are, including your body, brain, mind, all your ideas about reality, science, religion, logic, life, sex, everything. Everything is included. Absolutely everything is included. All of that are a set of constraints and limits which you're attached to. As long as you're attached to that, how can you become God? You can't because you think you're a limited human thing. So the only way you can become God is by relinquishing your sense of self. And of course, what does that mean? That means physical death from your perspective. You can't just detach from your mental notions of self. That's not enough because you're still going to be identified with yourself as a physical human creature. That's very limiting. That's not enough to get you to absolute infinity. If you want to experience the total unity of the entire shebang, all of it, at once, you have to die. You can't survive that process. So the way that God, that God hides himself from you is simply by the fact that you think you are you. And that thinking and believing that you're you and not God is the only thing that separates you from God. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. How the whole thing works. It's extremely elegant and beautiful in its design. It's, you might say, perfect. The deception that you are playing on yourself as God to be yourself is perfect. Because see, here's what God is doing. God, as the absolute, wanted to experience all of its own richness. But how can it do that? It really can't unless it first limits itself. Because in its absolute form, it's everything. So there's nothing for it to discover. There's nothing for it to do. It's just everything and nothing at the same time. So God, in its infinite wisdom, what it did is it started to create limitations within itself because then the limitations can explore other limitations, interact with them, and then they can have this sort of sense of discovery and this way, God can marvel at its own structure. See, you might think that absolute infinity doesn't need that because it already has everything. But the one thing absolute infinity doesn't have is it doesn't have limitation. You see, because when you're absolutely everything, you're completely unlimited. You might sound like, well, that's great. That's how I'd want to stay. I'd always want to be unlimited. Well, you'd get bored of that after a while, in a sense you'd want to explore 
all the limitations within you. And so that's what God is busy doing. And that's why God created my perspective, created your perspective. And of course, God is not separate from us. So we are God creating these perspectives. So it's sort of like, in a sense, you know, uh, the movie Men in Black, where they have that sort of um, uh, memory flasher wiper uh, gadget where they hold it up in front of you, it flashes and it erases all the memories that you had about a certain event. That's sort of what God did to himself. It's sort of like God existed as everything and then God said, you know what? Let me try to exist as not God, but as a finite thing. What would it be like to not be God? That's sort of what God thought. Of course, God doesn't really think, but that's sort of like what God thought if we anthropomorphize God. And so he said, okay, let me actually try it. And so he took a little memory flasher thing. He flashed it in his own eyes, forgetting the fact that he is God and that he created everything. And then he created a, just like a perspective, a limited perspective of him as a human being or as an ant or as a, a cat or whatever. And now we are all walking around as these like limited um, <laughs> zombified versions of the absolute. And then our whole job in life is to play this game and to realize more and more and more and to become more and more conscious of the infinity of everything and just how amazing it is. And that's basically what life boils down to in a nutshell. And so your journey is from the limited to the infinite and then back from the infinite to the limited. And this is all happening simultaneously. See, it's not happening across time the way you might think. Because for God, it already happened. It's only from our limited perspective that it seems like there's time unfolding, stuff's evolving, stuff's happening. It's both true that stuff is evolving, but also that it's not evolving. It depends on your perspective. From the relative perspective, stuff is always evolving. From the absolute perspective, um, there's no such thing. It's all there simultaneously. It's the ALF. And, of course, these things are not separate from themselves. So that's absolute infinity for you. The question is, do you desire it for yourself? Do you desire to cognize it? To directly experience it? Because that's the only thing that makes a difference here. I'm not telling you all this stuff so that you can believe me and then go out there preaching to people, writing comments such as, oh yeah, God is absolute infinity. That does no good at all. Because when you say God is absolute infinity, from a position of not having experienced it yourself, you're actually lying. It's just a fantasy for you. It's not true at all for you because you haven't experienced it. You're just walking around and you're serving as a, a vector for this mental virus of absolute infinity. That's what it is. That's the only way I can communicate to you is to infect you with this mental virus, this meme of absolute infinity. Your job is to see that you have been infected and then you've got two, two options. You can either just be infected and then run around infecting others the way that most people do and wreck a lot of havoc. And that's a very dangerous thing. You'll hurt a lot of people, including yourself, doing that. And the second way is to recognize, ah, I've been infected for a reason. The reason I was infected was so that I could go and actualize this infection in myself. And not so that I can run around blabbermouthing and infecting other people blindly. You see? It's a big difference. And it's, a, <laughs> it's one that gets lost on a lot of people. Very easy to miss this point. So if you are serious about actualizing this, then my question is, how much do you desire it? Do you actually desire to know the truth? That's the most important thing. You might say, well, Leo, give me a technique and I'll just go do it. No, that's not good enough. This is not about a technique or a formula. This is about your desire. You need to purify your desire. Do you really want it? Why do you want it? 
Are you going to prioritize it over all your other bullshit in life? Because your life is filled with ego distractions. From business, to making money, to having sex, to raising kids, to going to school, to getting good grades, to, to eating good food, to going to parties, to doing everything under the sun, including reading books about absolute infinity and about God, you'll do absolutely everything except actually experience absolute infinity. Because again, like I said, this requires you surrendering your most precious thing, which is yourself. The only way you can overcome that is with a desire, a high quality, high consciousness desire for the truth, which trumps all other concerns. That's what's necessary. How do you develop that truth? It's an inner knowing. It's an inner wisdom. Wisdom is required on your part. I can't beat it into you. You honestly have to see that this is something that is your mission in life to discover. And if you can't see that, then you're hopeless. And even if you can see it, but your desire is still weak and it's flagging and it's easily diverted by distractions, by television, by porn, by internet, by all the nonsense that goes on, by arguing with people, by trying to prove other people wrong, and all this on and on and on. If you're distracted by all those, then your desire is just too weak. And that's why you will never see absolute infinity. But if you can really purify your desire, then all the doors will magically start to open for you, even if you don't have the techniques right now, even if you don't know what the next step is. As long as you've got that desire in place, that will be enough to move you forward. And then you trust in that desire and you follow that desire and you make sure you stick to principles like radical open-mindedness and turning inward rather than turning outward in your self-actualization efforts. And you just keep working that and of course, you keep learning, you keep reading, you keep watching videos, you keep going to seminars, you keep meditating, doing all these practices, and you will start to see yourself moving towards absolute infinity. And then one day, it'll happen to you. And then there's no going back after that. And if you do want techniques, hell, I've got plenty of videos that I've shot in the past that explain many different techniques for how to become enlightened. Go look at those. I have a whole playlist on actualize.org, a whole category called Meditation and Enlightenment. Click on that category. You'll see all my videos related to that. On my forum, I also have Leo's Practical Guide to Enlightenment, which is a long post where I give you a guide, step-by-step -step instructions for how to do self-inquiry. So there's tons of techniques available, and my techniques are not the only techniques. You can go out there and find hundreds, literally hundreds of different techniques from all the spiritual schools, from Christianity to Buddhism to anything else. Uh, I do happen to think that my techniques are some of the most direct techniques that you'll find out there. Uh, a lot of the spiritual schools will tend to kind of lead you around in circles because, uh, well, um, they are more committed to their traditions and dogmas than they are to getting you directly to the truth. But there are good teachers out there, so you can go find them as well. Uh, you can do meditation retreats, workshops, and so on. And that's it. The only lesson here, really, is to go experience it for yourself. Everything I said here is not the truth. All my words are false. All words can ever be relative to the absolute is to be false. So that's just the nature of words. Don't get trapped by that. Consider this as just poetry, as me infecting you with some virus, which maybe you will or you won't actualize. That is up to you. That's it here. I'm signing off. Please click the like button for me. Share this episode with a friend. Post your comments down below and come check out actualize.org. I have resources there for you. Check out the forum. Check out my blog. Uh, check out my course. Check out my book list. All of those will be helpful in your journey to actualize the infinite. And stick with me in the future for more juicy episodes about... Uh, this and other topics. As far as this series goes, I thought that there might be more parts than just two, but I think that we covered everything in these two parts. They were both kind of long, I know, 
but this is just how the format turned out to be. So we're done with this series. Maybe in the long distant future, I'll shoot a part three or a part four if I gather more information. But that's it. Hope you enjoyed it.